Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Herbert Louis. He is a writer and an editorial director. His editorial studio, Wonder Shuttle, works with companies such as Shopify, Twilio, and Skillshare, which is where I originally met him. He's also the author of Creative Doing, which is a book and a collection of exercises, mental models, and true stories from prominent artists to help you find your very own unique creative process. He's a prolific creator and has many creative projects, including the book, The World According to Kanye, which was featured in Hypebeast, and the hosts of Prologue, where he talks with artists like Post Malone to talk about the early days of their creative journeys. I brought him on the podcast to talk about creative process and developing a creative habit. There's no one size fits all approach, but there are common frameworks that everybody can follow. We cover a lot of topics, including the four step creative process, capturing ideas, quality versus quantity, and promoting your own work. We also dive deep into the inner working of his note taking process that was inspired by Ryan Holiday. We look through his note cards, his notion, and his air table, and we cover much, much more. Herbert has a very organized, chaotic process, which I can relate to, and I'm sure many of you can as well. If you take one idea or tactic to apply to your own creative process, then I think this episode will be worth your time. Without further ado, please welcome Herbert Louis to the Conscient Opera Corn Show. Today I have Herbert Louis, who I've known for a while. He actually worked with me at Skillshare on developing our content strategy, particularly worked with me on writing content. And I remember those times as being super creative and being very proud of a lot of the content we created, but also how hard and difficult and the slog it felt to shift from like running a company to sitting down and write. And I remember a lot of our meetings being around trying to get into a good rhythm and having really prolific output. So thanks for joining and it's great to reconnect. Yes. Good to be here and I'm super excited to chat. Yeah. So the reason I reached out is I saw that you wrote a new book and the book is really around developing creative habit or being creative. And one thing I thought we can talk about today was how one could design their own creative process. I think reading through the book. I realized that there isn't really like a one size fits all for everyone, but there are some general themes or frameworks that all creative processes kind of follow. And then within that, you kind of have to mix and match work, what works for you. So I thought it'd be fun to talk about that and just talk about creativity. For sure. That sounds great. I mean, I think the only thing I'd add is also like, it was a really, you know, when you mentioned working at Skillshare a while back, it was like a really good time. I feel like I worked you were like a solid writer. Like I remembered, like we tried a bunch of things and you're like, I think I can do the writing. You do the editing, maybe some of the promo and like, just, just like coach me along a little bit, but you're like, it was really great to work with you on that. I remembered we had a goal. We were like, let's hit a hundred K on medium. And we did. So it was, it was a really fun experience. I think that time was pretty, like when I look back at a lot of the things I've done in my career. That time was very fun and creative. So I kind of read through all your stuff. I thought it was pretty amazing of all the stuff you're doing, but I thought it'd be good to start with how the creative process works, particularly that four-step creative process. I know you outlined it in your book, but I thought it would be good for you to give the overview on that process and, and what the stages are, and maybe we can just go through each one and, and dissect that. So... Before we dive in, I think that the important thing to keep in mind with there, there's a reason this four step creative process is helpful. And it's because creativity is so broad, like it's this human experience is so broad, right? Especially now everyone can make so many things in so many different ways. And it's all about expression. And so within all of this freedom comes like a bunch of creative kind of chaotic energy, right? Spontaneous, super childlike, super playful. You oftentimes it helps to have a structure to channel all of this energy through. And that's where something like the four step creative process comes in. And so the, you know, without, without further ado, the four stages are preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. Stage one preparation is all about doing the research doing the references, probably like thinking with your hands a little bit, doing sketches, writing drafts, dictating notes. It could be all sorts of things, right? Explorations. Incubation is when you take a step back 
you're like, okay, cool. I'm going to relax a little bit. I'm going to get away from this problem. Sometimes you need a lot of preparation before you feel comfortable incubating. Other times you're like, hey, I don't have time. I'm just going to put it down for a while, go for a walk, go for a shower, relax, go for vacation. Illumination is the aha moment when all of a sudden, somewhere in the day, sometimes when you're incubating, sometimes when you're preparing, the idea just comes at you and you're like, oh my gosh, I've, I've got it. Eureka, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And you, you feel it. It's a very visceral feeling. You feel it like throughout your body, in your stomach, in your chest, whatever it is, right? You're like, I got it. This is super energizing. And then verification is when you're trying to understand if this moment of inspiration really has, is really, if you've found a way to express that moment of inspiration properly, and if you found the right time, place, people, the right way to publish, and all of these things. Where did this process evolve from? Is this something you created or is this based on like some scientific research or how, how did this evolve? Right. So this evolved. The person who popularized or put it together was this gentleman named Graham Wallace. That I think he also co-founded the London School of Economics. He'd borrowed it from like a physicist who had the first three stages. He added the fourth. And then throughout, actually, a lot of other people have tweaked this linear process to make it their own, right? Maybe they'll split the incubation stage into two things. They'll add a verification stage at the end, right? Maybe like an exploration or whatever. But yeah, I found the four-step one to be the, the foundation for where everything started. Yeah, the stage that's most interesting or something unexpected was a preparation stage. And it reminds me of the Rick Rubin book around the artist is always being an artist and always looking and searching and capturing thoughts or ideas or lyrics. I kind of noticed that with a lot of articles I read around the creative process with prolific creators that they're always thinking and they have a way to capture a lot of those ideas. And I always thought it was this, like you sit down at your desk and you just have this stroke of inspiration and you just start writing or creating. And I found that to be not true. Right. I mean, I, that resonates with me too. Like a couple of things come to mind. I remember in the earlier episode with Henrik, you talked, you both talked about writing your ideas down. He would talk about writing inklings down. I have like, like multiple air table bases, just thousands of like inklings of like blog posts. Oh, this could be interesting. That could be interesting. Right. There's a prompt in, in creative doing that's called do your work without your equipment. And the example there was like this YouTuber who's also a photographer would, would suggest, Hey, go for, go for a walk without your camera, but like try to pay attention to what a good photograph would look like. And I feel like a lot of people can, can do that with their craft as well. Right. Like Jay-Z memorizing or like freestyling and trying to remember stuff is like he, he doesn't have the pen and paper or the mic when he was in his very early career. He's just trying to like drum up like new ideas while he's, you know, doing, doing his business. Uh, yeah. And then as far as that four step process, is it, are there any differences where, where it comes to how people can personalize it for themselves or is it pretty much pretty similar for everyone? The, the process is linear because it helps go from front to end. Right. But. As I kind of started off with, the creative process is like so broad that I think that a verification stage often can turn into preparation for the next thing. Like when you're like, oh, I'm trying to see if this idea works. It's like, well, actually, I got a ton of like new material. And now I can decide, hey, do I want to move forward with this or do I want to kind of like incubate this new idea? Right. But what helps is having like a linear thing go from, OK, I'm here. Now I'm here. Now I'm here. Now I'm there. Because otherwise it's like, oh, I, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm confused. I don't know which stage, which idea is. And like, there's just so many things. So oftentimes I think that staying organized and like writing things down, taking photographs, drawing things out, whatever, recording like a melody, organizing your depart departure points, which is like another prompt in creative doing. It's something that a lot of artists did. I mean, Mozart did it back in the day where 
he would kind of like take fragments of of songs that came to him and he would keep these organized and eventually find places to use them. What are your thoughts on quality and quantity? Right. So it's it's a funny story. Maybe around a decade ago, I wrote this post called Why Quantity Should Be Your Priority. Just with the premise that when you aim for quality, it's actually really hard to achieve that goal directly and a much more widely applicable and maybe more consistent approach is to aim to make a lot of things and and that will lead you to find something that's of high quality and so i think that there's there are many examples of people taking this approach the ones that come off the top of my head are Yayoi Kusama making over 9,000 pieces of art, Chantal Martin making easily over 5,000 pieces of art. Like they allow perfection to emerge rather than, rather than trying to aim for it directly, you know? I think, so I think quantity is the, is the approach to get to the long, far goal of quality. There's a couple of other reasons as well. I think that it works really well. When you aim for quantity, you tap into the power of the long tail, right? So me and you, we're constantly making stuff. We don't really know what's going to hit. Like we can predict and we can have the things we like. But a lot of times the things we like aren't what other people like. And the things other people like aren't what we thought would, would hit. And so when you make a lot of stuff, each of these attempts are, it's, I liken it to lottery tickets in many ways. Like you're making a new lottery ticket and you just don't know what's going to happen. But when you make a lot of things, then you can tap into the long tail. It's like a verification process in many ways. And then lastly, just quantity is a really nice structure for practice. So, hey, I'm going to make, I'm going to play piano, this song six times. It's kind of like the, the original example in my brain of that. But hey, I'm going to write a blog post every day. I'm going to write read paragraphs of this every day. I'm going to make a new thing every day sort of vibe is it keeps you energized and it keeps you going rather than just like if you aim for quality directly, I've found, I mean, I think it works for some people, but I've found more often than not in my case, I'm just like, oh, like it's not good enough, still not good enough, still not good enough. And then it's very like, I, I lose a lot of energy in situations like that. Yeah. And a lot of momentum too, when you're trying to make something, I guess, perfect or super high quality. It's just really hard to meet that minimum bar of, I guess, craftsmanship. Right. Try to get that out the door. So I have a lot of things that I've written that I've never shipped because I don't think it's ready yet. I love the idea of quantity leads to quality, especially if you have like a minimum bar where you, you don't really dip below because I can, sh you know, anyone can ship a lot of things out the door. It could be really, really crappy where you're not proud of it. So I think being proud of it, you know, having fun learning and just getting into that habit, I think is pretty important. And I think that's the big lesson or learning that I had was opposite of what I thought creativity was, which is a stroke of inspiration and more around this discipline and this habit that you have to kind of work at like an athlete. It's just a different muscle that you're, you're practicing. For sure. And I mean, that's a really good point too. I think that defining what's acceptable to you, like I mean, you can define two different things. It's like what's good is like your criteria for quality, right? Creating quality rubric is often a really good approach to that. But also like uh, defining what's acceptable, just like that minimum bar you talked about and then making a lot of those things that meet that acceptable bar. And like the, the more you make, you know, naturally the lower the bar has to go because like, well, I don't have time. And yeah, you get to decide what that bar is for you, though. That's the most important thing. And I think that, you know, a producer I talked to for the book, you know, they, they basically suggested, hey, like, your definition of quality is going to drive your work as an artist because everyone has a different definition of it. And I thought that point really resonated with me a lot. I was like, oh, like, that's totally true. What you think is good and what I think is good is different. So even if we start from the same idea, we'll end up in two completely different places, which is 
which is the best part of being creative. It's like, oh, I, I didn't know you'd take it there. And I, I didn't know I would take it here. It's kind of cool to compare. Yeah, I think, I think that minimum bar is pretty critical because it just pushes something out in the world that you're proud of and something that you wanted to create and share. What are other things that limit people from creating or putting things out there, you know, from a quantity standpoint? For sure. I think, I think for a lot of people, the, the, the balance between creative process and creative results is like very, is a very delicate balance. And I think a lot of times we think about, Hey, here's what the work is going to do for me. It's going to win me this award. It's going to, you know, make me this amount of money. I think that's like one of the maybe the op critical opinions I have on the creator economy, like all of so much of the advice in creator economy is like how to monetize, yes. how to like go viral, how to do this and not enough on like, Hey, here's how you actually like make something you're proud of. Here's how to actually like get these ideas out there. And so I think naturally one place where one sticking point for a lot of people is they're thinking way too far in the future thinking too far about the results and not focused enough on the process itself. If we kind of like plot it out on an like results or expectations on an X axis and pressure on a Y axis, the, there's like at least a linear relationship, maybe even an exponential one, right? It's like the, the higher your expectations go after a certain point, the pressure like crushes you. It's like, oh my gosh, like it's never going to be good enough to meet what's in my head. I think that's how writer's block starts. And the, the solution to that is to dial the expectations back, which is really hard. And I don't think, I haven't found a way to do that like in my head. I have to do it by writing a blog post every day. Cause then I'm like, oh yeah, like it's cool. I, I don't have an expectation that this post is gonna, you know, go viral or anything. I'm and I'm doing another one tomorrow and I did one yesterday. So it's all good, right? And that kind of lightness kind of helps balance things back out. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm just focused on finding something good to say, something interesting to show people. And then, and that's it. It like helps decrease the pressure. So there are a couple prompts in creative doing. It's like relax expectations is one, relinquish results is the other. Both of them are both centered on like, hey, it's not, of course, we care about what's going to happen and we care about the end goal as well as like what we can do with it. But let's drop that for a second. Let's like put that down for a sec. Let's really focus on what's in front of us. Let's focus on what part of ourselves we can give to the work, to other people, what part of ourselves we don't want to share yet, right? Those are all really important things. So just going back to the creative process, let me see if I could explain this that kind of unifies. So there's the preparation phase, which is essentially gathering all these inputs of what inspires you, little nuggets of ideas, quotes. It could be any of the above, depending on what you're doing. And everyone has their own way of doing that. So, so for you, you do, and we, we'll go into your note-taking system. Maybe for Virgil, he just had like a laptop with just images of everything, but everyone has right. some collection method to kind of prime the pump. And then you go into this incubation phase where all those inputs kind of just marinate. And one day you're just gonna walk down the street and an idea is just gonna pop in your head that gets you super excited. So that stroke of genius, that excitement, maybe it's an article you're thinking about, maybe it's a business idea. And then you go into this verification stage where you kind of evaluate it to see if that's something worth pursuing. And if so, you execute it. And I think a lot of people have talked about the execution phase, right? Yeah. There's so much productivity tips on how to execute an idea. But what I'm the most curious about is this, the first half, because I think we know what it feels like to get struck with like some inspiration for idea where it's just like, oh, it just clicks in your head. A preparation phase is something that to me is the most interesting because it requires a level of dedication and work to prime the pump to say to constantly searching for those writing those things down i don't really have a process i wish i did because over 10 or 20 years i feel like i should have a repository of just tens of thousands of nuggets that i can just pull from 
So that's kind of what I'm curious about to learn from you, which is your note-taking process. What does this preparation stage look like? I've read that book, the How to Take Smart Notes, but it felt like it was written for, from a scientist, you know, researcher. And I was like, dude, this is too much friction for me. Um, <laughs> right. But that's kind of, you know, out of the whole four-step process, I would love to dive into there. Maybe start with like, as a writer, how do you prepare? What does that look like? Okay. Super interesting. 10 years ago, I, I found out about Ryan Holiday and Robert Greene's note-taking method. I mean, it's Robert's through Ryan. I found out about it. And I was like, hey, this is a really cool way to try to write a book. And at the time, I had, I had set my ambitions on doing that. And so I bought, the, I bought these cards and I started, I started, hey, every time I finished reading a book after a week, I would like write like all of the notes in there, which did not work, by the way, because there's too many, uh, there's too many things to write. At best, maybe from one book, I would guess, like, I think I've heard Robert say three notes, unless it's like a really good book. Me personally, I would probably aim for like five to 10. And it's good to be able to do that because then you can discern, hey, here's like the most important thing I got out of the book. You're being very mindful when you do that. And you're almost editing live in a way too. You're like, this is important. Yep. This is not important. You, so on. Can you just describe what that process is real quick for people that, I, I know what you're referring to because I also wrote okay, yeah. an article that I tried oh, to do, but cool. what, what is Robert Greene's process that right. kind of kicked this whole thing off for you? Yes. So Robert Greene's process is whenever he reads a book, he will take notes in, on the side and write some margin notes down, marginalia. And he will also, he'll be highlighting things. He'll be trying to have a conversation with the book. And then when he's done, he will go back and review the, each of the things he highlighted, but also try to summarize what he highlighted into maybe like a four by six index card. And I believe he actually color codes his, he buys like colored cards to be able to group themes together for the thing he's working on. And so if he's working on a book about power, he might read a biography about Disney and then like take notes from there and like group it according to certain themes. And every, every, so he might find like three, five, 10 index cards worth of notes from, you know, hundreds of pages. I think, I think that, that is super interesting. So, you know, going back to me for a sec, I didn't know at the time that there was only so many notes from each book. And I was like, oh, I would take like dozens, hundreds of note cards from a very ordinary book. And it just didn't work. I was like, I don't understand why this isn't working. This is so boring. But I was being kind of mindless about it. But I, you know, without being too hard on myself too, I was, I was trying it out. I was like practicing. Mm -hmm. I was like, this isn't really quite working. So, so throughout the years, I, like I kind of lost momentum with it. And I don't think it was for a lack of discipline. I just, it just didn't work for me. I picked it. I've tried picking it back up multiple times. And that book you mentioned, How to Take Smart Notes, is what unlocked. It was the extra little thing that I needed. So I'll tell you something, Michael. I'm a Virgo. Okay. My birthday's in September. So I need, what really bugged me about every single note I took was I was scared I would lose it. I would be like, oh, this, this like, they need to be in order somehow. And they were not in their method, right? Or maybe I, they didn't document how. I, I haven't talked to either of them directly about it. But in How to Take Smart Notes, I didn't read the whole thing. I skimmed, like just kind of flitting through the important parts or what I thought were important. And this like, so here's an example of a note that I would take. I'll describe it for audio as well. It's basically like, it's, it's like a quote a paragraph of a quote and then some comments or thoughts in the second, third of the, of the, of the card. But I have like a unique index number for every single card. So in this case, it's, it's a 17 A to A. And so yeah, what's that the, even mean? What's 17 A to A mean? Right, exactly. So 
So Thread 17, I used to have an index card for all this. Thread 17 was a thread that I'd started about confidence. So it was about like the relationship we have between optimism, confidence versus reality and doubt. So that, that topic has always been very interesting to me. So I started every single topic that I'm researching starts with like a single number or a double digit number. So it's like, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then this happens to be 17. I'm up to 50 now, maybe. What and about, then do you mostly, oh yeah. do you mostly do this just for things you're currently working on? What, or, you know, let's say you just read an interesting article and you grab a note, create a note from that. Like, where does that, I guess, do you do both? And where does it go? If you do I would, right. Now, today, I don't do both. I usually do something that I'm working on or something that I learned that's really fresh that I'm like, I need to remember this. So I will, I think when, you know, in a different time, maybe a couple of years ago when I was working more independently and had like vast blocks of like un uninterrupted time, I would definitely do both where I would be like, oh, let's do like half, you know, very purpose-driven, very intentional notes and then half like hey here's just like something i really liked that i read and i can't really i'll probably start a new thread for it you know because i can't end a place in the current ones for it that's how i ended up at 50. yeah so Which that's seems like right now majority of the cards that you're creating are related to things that you're working on so much Ron yeah. green where he's actively seeking out information for things that he's working on and trying to capture those and connect them right exactly so but for most people they could do either or right or both they could they can do i think if want. you're exploring yeah, yeah if you're kind of exploring and you have the time i would highly encourage you to do both or even just do the ones that are interesting to you if this is an underrated problem a lot of people face i think knowing what you want to say you're like, hey, okay, cool. I'm going to create content. I'm going to start tweeting. You know why it's so hard is because I don't know what to say. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm just, I'm just responding maybe sometimes, but I don't know what I'm going to proactively say. So if you have that problem, it's like just taking notes of things you're interested in is really helpful. And so the, I'll, I'll pick up also on the, on the codes because it's related. So this is 17. A to A. So thread 17 is confidence. A, I, I'm like off the top of my head, I can't remember. I, if I pulled up Notion, I could probably tell you. But this one is about self-talk. So I'm guessing the A was about, might have been about how you talk to yourself or the, like metacognition sort of thing. So A to B will probably be, I haven't taken it yet, but I'm guessing it will be related to a self-talk topic. Whereas let's say 17B1 is about like positive illusions about yourself. So self-deception, you know, kind of a, a mentally healthy person appears to have the enviable capacity to distort reality in a direction that enhances self-esteem. I won't keep going. That's yeah. part of the note. But so, okay, 17B is about I see. reality distortion, right? So from... The powerful thing about this is every time you start, you take a note, you have to find a place for it. You're like, okay, this doesn't have a number yet. Well, you kind of go through your old notes and then you're like, oh, like, wait, I wrote about this. This could go here, but that could also go there too. And you have to decide, hey, you're reviewing your old notes, which is really powerful. And then B, you're starting to filter out, okay, maybe these two ideas, actually, I didn't see this connection, but this card kind of connects them both. And now I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to write the code, but then I'll also relate. Oh, I'll write the code of the other card into this, this one that, so that there's a bi-directional connection, you know? Yeah. So he, uh, I guess uh, Nicholas Lumen was the original inventor of the bi-directional links. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I mean, yeah. Follow-up question. Why are you writing this out by hand? Are you doing both this and putting them into Notion? What, like, what is it? <laughs> What does this process yeah. look like? I'm laughing because like, it's the most absurd. Like if I explain this, I worry that I'm going to sound like I'm going to like, I don't know how I'm going to be, how people will make sense of this, but here's, but here's my clearest explanation. 
but I think everyone has oh, their yeah. own process, right? So whatever works for you, it's yes. fine. And then I'm curious to learn because I'm going to probably take bits and pieces of how you do it and try to implement it for myself because I did the same thing you did. Because when that whole second brain thing came out, I was just started taking a lot of notes and I was like, dude, these notes are whack. And I think the thing I've realized is that relating it to an original idea or any idea is, is the part of the process, not just right. highlighting and taking a shit ton of notes and then trying to sift through them. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, I think you stumbled on an insight there, which is the same one I came across. I take it by hand because it slows me down. Got it. I like the slowness because writing by hand, first of all, it gets really tiring if you're not used to it. And B, like, it's not as quick as like copy, paste, put it in here, done, right? It's like every card takes me at least on average, like 10 minutes, Jeez. which is kind of silly. It's like, why, why does it take so long, right? I don't know. I don't know. I have to find a place for it. I can't rush it. Like, an hour is six note cards. I've tried fitting seven. I've tried fitting nine. It just, it just, I either sit there longer yeah. or like, I Wait. can't do it. So how many cards do you have right now? And how many do you do per day on average? Right. So right now I only brought a few with me to the, to the, this workspace I'm in. I brought like five kind of just to show. So I do, I take them by hand. I have like a thousand plus in the entire collection but the problem with taking them by hand is they're not very portable they're like in fact they're quite they're the like i can think of only like sculptures maybe are the worst thing to move after books and notes and so it's like i moved a couple of times and and i i mean i moved countries a couple of times and so i didn't I brought them the first time. I was like, oh, this is a really heavy lift. So the second time I moved countries, I didn't, I didn't move all of them. And fortunately for me, I decided to start digitizing most of them, maybe around like 200 or 300 note cards in. So this is also why it takes 10 minutes. I'll like write it out by hand. Then I will type it up in Notion. And like, uh, I just, again, Notion, I just went on YouTube, saw someone's like template for it copied it and i was like okay cool i'm just gonna do it like this and we'll see how it goes and yeah so far so good i'm able to find a lot of stuff i just found out about i mean not i recently found out about notion ai so i was like oh this is probably going to be interesting too but at the very least i can discover things where it's like once you start having hundreds of note cards it's very hard to remember hey where did i put this again mm -hmm. so you're like oh this was i think like this person said something about that. I can quickly search it and find it. And then, you know, if I had the cards with me, I would just go through and be like, oh yeah, what was this about again? But the other thing I really like about taking it by hand is I just like writing by hand. Like there's no, I know there's like potentially like memory benefits or, you know, whatnot, but that's not really why I do it. I just do it because I like it. I'm going to be honest. Like I've always liked writing by hand and now I kind of like writing on note cards a lot. And so it really works for me. It just like I leave the every note I take, I leave feeling like more energized than when I started. Yeah. And I think that's what really works for me. And I would encourage people to find if you're listening to this, like you want to find what works for you too, right? Like the notes thing might not work for everyone. And it's like you said earlier, it's like it's everyone's unique creative process. It's like very different and it's very special. Because it reflects you as a person. Because you're there's also your one in eight billion. Yeah. So for the note cards, do you ever just write like an original idea that you were thinking of? Or is it always like some research based note like Robert Green? Right. So what's interesting now is I actually find I kind of have a hybrid thing going on with yeah. my blog and these notes. I find, you know, every writing every day does take time as well. And so I've actually found myself quoting like a blog post or something a little more often than before. But I would also say that sometimes certain cards are almost, they're like connection cards. They're like, oh, I just saw this connection. I don't have a connection between them yet. So I'm going to try to like make sense of what this is. And it could be like, hey, I don't know how to land this or I have a hunch about that. But and then insert like thought here, right? Is there something related to 
whatnot. And I think the most important, one of the more important, like attitudinal changes I made to taking notes is I decided to treat both my blog and my notes like a, like a septic tank. And so it's like, like all of the waste goes in and the notes and the blog clean it out. And then I'm going to know, Hey, like, okay, after it's only after it's in the note card and, and the note box or my blog that I'm like, Oh, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Or maybe like this needs more work or, you know, maybe this was completely irrelevant. I don't know, but it's there. And I wouldn't have been able to filter it out with just my brain alone. Got it. Like it, having these two things really helps. Tied to that, what, why are you blogging daily? Like what, what prompt to that? It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a lot of work. I would say that I, I started blogging every day as part of a hundred day, the hundred day project. So this woman, Lindsay Jean Thompson runs this project every year. It's about to start for 2024 actually. And it's just the hundred day project.org. And it's basically a challenge to do, to repeat your creative operation every day. And I think she was inspired by Michael Beirut and a class that he does where I think it was, you know, purely on, on a creative operation. So people might dance, people might make a poster every day, so on and so forth. And so for me, I was like, Hey, I, I talked to Lindsay for my book. I was like, Hey, why don't I just try this project while I'm kind of working on this, editing the, the second version of this book at the time. And, and so I decided, Hey, I'll just start writing a blog post every day. It'll be very short. You know, five sentences is like my acceptable bar. I was like, anything less is like probably a little too copy pasty, but five sentences is like reasonable. And I mean, I can definitely come up with five. And so that's how I started. And then at the end of the hundred days, I was like, Hey, I'm having like so much fun with this. It gives me a lot of energy. I think like my, my wife feels a difference. My friends feel a difference. I bring more of it to work as well. So it helps, like it helps create a lot of energy for the other things in my life. And so I was like, Hey, I'm just going to keep doing this. How, how many days have you been doing it now? I've lost count. I think I, I like wrote. 615, maybe like several months back or a few months back, just because I was like, I saw a blog post that was about blogging for the hell of it. And how I think the author was saying, Hey, like, I kind of missed that. Why don't we do this more? You know? And I was like, Oh, like I've been doing this for like 615 days and it's been like really fun. And yeah, I think that's like kind of around the number, but I, I mean, my bar has also gotten much lower as well. Like sometimes I'll post an image and kind of like two sentences. Yesterday was like two quotes that I really liked because life circumstances change too. How does your note-taking process help you write daily or just write in general? Yeah. I would say that whenever I'm working on a topic that I think I've covered before, it's really helpful to be able to go into both like creative doing, so to find the prompts, but also to pull up Notion and be like, hey, I feel like I remember, let's say, oh, this motto from this company was really interesting. What was it again? And which company was it again? So I'll like quickly search like, like the keywords that are like coming to my mind. I think it was something about like competitive yet amateur, right? Something like that. And then I'll search it and then say, like, oh yeah, it was by the company that makes these like running shoes. And and honoring that spirit and, oh yeah, here's the full one. Here's the original source. And so I can like share that to the blog in a, probably like a longer post somewhere. But the, the main difference is I can't, I mean, I don't share my notion because that's like a little more private. I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm working on these ideas, but on my blog, I'm sharing everything. So I had a friend message me a couple of weeks ago saying, Hey, like, what are your thoughts on AI and copywriting and how that's affected your work? And I was like, I didn't, I didn't see it until maybe a couple hours later, but he was like, oh, never mind. I found your blog post about cool. it. And so I was like, oh, well, that's amazing. And then here's a couple more that I wrote on the topic, but it was cool for that. He would be able to pull that really quickly. And I think that's, that's someone I know, but I imagine there's also like a lot of people I don't know who are reading this, who are 
like kind of, you know, following along, maybe on RSS, maybe on checking direct, but they're like, I get to teach them how I think a little more every day. And I think there's something really nice about that, that I, that I value. Yeah. How do you keep track of all the future topic ideas that you want to write about? Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned like the iPhone notes, like Taylor Swift iPhone notes. Like I also have like an iPhone note, just blog posts. Got it. Um, I ha- I often like, I'll write it down anywhere I can. Like, it's very like, oh, don't lose it. It'll be on a note card. It'll be on a note, iPhone note. It'll be in my air table. And, and I, I don't feel the pressure to like, I don't feel the pressure to like develop it. I think one key thing that I, I forgot to mention that's really important is I take notes to forget. Like I want to write this down. So I'm, my brain is free to forget it later. You know, it's like, oh, like I'll be able to find it and I feel confident and it's like, okay, I can relax again. You mentioned Airtable a couple of times. What do you use Airtable for? Yeah, I use Airtable mainly to, as an organizing structure for my ideas. So there'll be one base that's full of like blog post ideas. Got it. There'll be another base that's like, hey, here's like a concept for a book. Here's like a hundred titles. Here's maybe the spine, two or three references of what I want it to be, like emotionally or intellectually or whatnot. Here's like a list of people I might want to interview. These are all in different tabs at the top of the base. Here's like some like concepts I can introduce and stuff. So for, for a larger book idea, that would be how I organize my air table. So it sounds like Zettelkasten is for just capturing ideas and notes. And then you use probably like Apple notes or something to just capture quick ideas. And yeah. then you import those in the air table. That's more of like a project management or, yes. breaking, and then yeah, you just write every day. Yeah, exactly. I think the theme I try to aim for is like controlled sloppiness. Yeah. If I don't have my air table open, then I'll just write it on like a new note or I'll send an email to myself. I'll like take a picture of something and try to email to myself. There, it's just like whatever kind of er method is around me, I'll just do it. So yeah, it's pretty extemporaneous and spontaneous sometimes. What does your writing process look like? Do you have a, like a time block where you just write as much as you can? Do you queue up all your posts? After doing 650 of these, like, what does that process look like today? Yeah. So for my daily blog posts, I think the happy place is like a week's worth of posts in advance. As I talk to you now, I've run out of that week. I've been like, just, I, I got to write one for today. Like after this call, I'll probably write one for today. And the funny thing is like, Right now, so I work a full-time job. And so actually a lot of my mornings are dedicated to that work, like editing, strategy, direction, outlining. So it's like, if I wasn't working full-time, I would probably be work, like writing or editing my own stuff at that point. And so now, because I am, I think I just find like chunks after work to be able to do that. A lot of times, like, Sometimes if I have like, you know, five minutes, I'll just think about, hey, what did I read yesterday before bed? And then like, oh, I really liked valuing your ignorance as a quote. That's kind of cool. Let me like try to find that full quote, paste it into the blog, and then try to relate it back to, hey, I used to try to find cheat codes and, and guides for games. And now I'm like the complete opposite. I'm like trying to not, I'm trying to avoid all of the spoilers something interesting there. Right. So that'll probably take place. I mean, yesterday it took place at like 9 PM. I was like really tired and I wrote up like actually two or three drafts of different things that just didn't work. I was like, both of these concepts are too big for me to work on right now. Like I'm too tired. So I save them in the draft. I save them in Airtable, And then I'm like, Hey, maybe, maybe today, you know, I'll be able to like refine it, edit it a little more for what I want to say, and then like publish it and schedule it. And then on a weekend, I try to get ahead on the weekend. I try to like, if it's a Saturday or Sunday, I have like two hours, I'll like queue a bunch of posts up. And then before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover? Yeah, I think when we talk about results versus 
process where I didn't talk about a lot was promoting your work. And actually it really fits in with what you said about being proud of your work. I think that a challenging part of a lot of creative processes, especially particularly if you're working within a structure, let's say, right? Within a publisher or a record label or whatnot, is you feel like almost dependent on them in some ways. You're like, okay, cool. I'm just going to be the author or the artist or the, you know, songwriter or whatnot. I think that what you want to aim for though, I think a lot of people with your expression, you want to be free. You're like, look, I just want to say what I want to say. I don't want your notes. I don't want anything. And I want to get it out to the people who want to hear it. And and sometimes there's people who get people, platforms, all these things that get in the way of that, right? And, and so you kind of feel like, okay, if I'm making music on Spotify, but my music doesn't sound like the contemporary thing, then I'm screwed. Like, I'm just, I'm not going to make it. And I think that couldn't be, I think the approach you need to take is to be very self-reliant. And one of the ways you become self-reliant is you learn how to promote your own work and connect with your audience directly so that you can always just keep making stuff and then and selling it to them and them wanting to buy it, right? Or giving them a chance to buy it. It's, I saw this, you know, maybe around a decade ago, just working with this recording artist, Ryan Leslie, as he was starting to, you know, shift his career to an independent path and also build out a tech startup to match that. He connected with like 33,000 of his fans directly just on text message because he was like, hey, I don't want the publicity and the tour. Like every time I do these things, I have to, every time I want to make a new album, I have to do all of those promotional things again just to be able to connect with an audience and even social media, like my you know, organic reach is decreasing. So all of the work I did to build a following there is gone. So I think like there was something really that I took away from that. And he just did another album first in a decade, like three weeks ago. It's really good. But what I took away from that was like, hey, if you can kind of keep in touch directly with your, the people who support your work, then you're, you also maintain your freedom in a sense. So, you know, you want to try to, you want to make work that you're proud of so that you're happy to promote it. You're not embarrassed or ashamed. And then you can show people and then they might want to buy it or they might not. It's not my thing. Maybe the next one, you know, and that's totally fine because you'll find new people for it as well. So I think like the results are often can be improved just by promoting your work a little more. I've been promoting this book for, you know, a couple of years now. I just got it into its first like brick and mortar retail store. Oh, was awesome. super excited about that. But like. It's, it's still like, I still plan on continuing to do it as well okay. while I work on the new one. Like, right. Hey, you want to pick the right thing to promote or pick the thing you're most proud of. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks for jumping on. I, hopefully this was helpful for you too, to like help generate or formulate some new ideas for you, for your future book or future content. Yes. It was my pleasure. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, I like you, I like your work a lot. I respect it all your body Likewise. of work a lot. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't do many podcasts anymore, but I was like, yo, if Michael's reaching out, this is the time to make an exception. Uh, this is this. like, yes, this is, I'm down. Yeah. So this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I appreciate it. Well, thanks, man.